Yeah, good, uh, <coughs> good morning all. As we do the what, who and why of Sardis, I'll embellish a bit, don't worry. There was a few comments earlier, mainly from Ian, about how I'm still wearing shorts. <coughs> um, and he said, your legs are not a pretty sight. So <coughs> for the next 20 minutes, please try not to look at my legs and concentrate on the gospel. <coughs> it can, I should imagine it can be pretty off-putting, but there you go. Okay, so... Um, yeah, it's, as always, it's a privilege to be able to preach to you. I love you guys, family to me. I love this church, and, and uh, I love being able to, to preach the Word of God to you. Um, this morning, we're continuing our series on Revelation, and the introductions of seven churches, the seven letters of seven churches. And this morning, we'll be looking at the fifth letter to the church at Sardis. <clears throat> I'm going to read the scripture in a minute. I'll read from the NIV. It's Revelation 3. One to six. Then I'll pray and then we'll dig into the, the letters, the commendation, the rebuke from Jesus. And importantly, what we can learn from it today, because without a message for today, it all becomes a bit irrelevant. So uh, I'm going to start reading Revelation 3, one to six from the NIV. It says this, To the angel of the church in Sardis, write... These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, who died to make us dressed in white, clothed in righteousness in your sight. We thank you for who you are, for what you are, and of what you have made us. And I pray this morning that as we study your word, we, you continue this process of making us a little more and more like Jesus in our walk. And Holy Spirit, you come down and talk through me and everyone gets something from this preach. As we study your word, may we go deeper and deeper into your word in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so as I was saying, this is the fifth of the seven letters that Jesus writes to the churches. Sardis is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible outside of Revelation. <clears throat> now, as we, as we go through Revelation, basically there are many, many views about what Revelation means and how the end times are going to pan out. The truth of the matter is no one knows exactly 100% how the end times are going to unfold. But the important thing is that we respect everyone's view because everyone will have different views and you'll see this coming out more as we get into the more meaty bits of Revelation. Um, <clears throat> There's a school of thought that each of these seven churches relate to an era in church history. Um, there's a lot more clever people than me who don't ascribe to this, and there's a lot more clever people than me than do. I do, and if you're interested in that sort of thing, Sardis would be the, the Reformation church, and it will go from about 1517 to 1750, the Great Awakening, when the evangelistic movement was birthed, of which, of which we're part. But that's by the by. So... Looking at the letter, uh, Sardis was a very wealthy city located on a major trade route in Asia Minor, which is Western Turkey. And like the rest of the Roman Empire, it was polytheistic. So they had many, many gods. Uh, the, main god, the main goddess of Sardis was Artemis. Artemis was a goddess of the hunt and of fertility. 
Sybil was a goddess of Mother Earth, and Dionysus was a god of wine. So very, very polytheistic. <clears throat> Interestingly, the first coins ever minted were here at Sardis. So the metal workers of Sardis found out the secret of minting coins of nearly pure gold and pure silver. So their value could be trusted throughout the known world. And for this reason, Sardis is acknowledged as the place where modern currency was invented. There's a claim to fame. It was a centre of carpet and wool industries, and even in the first century, garments were made here, <coughs> which is quite, um, quite relevant because you notice Jesus mentioned garments. You have a few who have not sold their clothes. He mentioned garments in his coats here. Um, something else Sardis was known for was a huge necropolis, basically city of death, necro death, polis city. And it's a huge necropolis, and for this reason, it gave, it gave Sardis a nickname, the Cemetery on a Thousand Hills. <coughs> Not one you'd want, but there you go. The Cemetery on a Thousand Hills. So to get the picture, the background, it's a very wealthy, pagan, immoral city. <coughs> I sort of liken it to an old version of the city of London. I worked in the city for 40 years, and trust me, it was very immoral. Money was the god. Anything goes, lap dancing, you can imagine all the stuff, all the temptations. Sin was in your face the whole time. It's all about you screwing someone else and making a buck. And I can imagine Sardis was, would be something along those lines. At some point, Sardis becomes influenced by Christianity. The, ancient, the remains of an ancient church were found near the, the, the remains of the Temple of Artemis. And the Christians there must have been a great witness to the local people a great influence in this pagan city. In AD 17, a huge earthquake erupted in the local area and Sardis was devastated. The emperor exempted them from taxes for five years to help them rebuild it, but it was never rebuilt to its former glory. So it's, it's heyday, if you like, ended with a great earthquake in AD 17. Okay, so that's a bit of the, the history of the church. So what can we learn from this letter to the church. Two things. You won't be surprised to know that the commendation and the rebuke from Jesus. Yeah. Very, very clever guy, Jesus. You can trust him, he knows everything. Okay, so we go for the commendation first. He says this You have a few names who have not soiled their clothes. So even among the dead Christians in Sardis, there are a few people who stayed faithful faithful to God. We heard in Pergamum and Thyatira in the previous ones, there are a few bad among the good. In Sardis, there are a few good among the bad. But bearing in mind all we've said, it's amazing there are even a few. In this pagan immoral city, there are a few good people who hadn't sold their clothes. Here's the thing. God only needs a few. Yeah, amen. Yeah. <clears throat> all throughout Bible, all throughout history, you can see how God's used a few to fulfill his purposes. Noah and his family, eight people. God used them to repopulate the earth. Three young Jewish boys, Sadrach, Mesach, Abednego, read Daniel 3, defied Nebuchadnezzar. As a result, Nebuchadnezzar, we will, not, we will go into the fire and our God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we will not worship your God we worship our God. A young Jewish princess, Esther, stood up to the king and saved the people. Twelve apostles. The Bible is full of God using a few people to do his purpose. He only needs a few. Christianity is about shining a light in the darkness. It's about saying the culture's leaning one way, but we're going to lean the other way and influence that culture for the gospel of Christ. This applies just as much now in Harlow as it did then in Sardis. Here's why the few in Sardis were crucial and why we're crucial now. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul is responding to rumours they had missed the return of Christ. He says this in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 7. 
Do not let anyone deceive you in any way. <clears throat> For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Right, question time. Hands up if you're the light of the world. Hands up if you're the salt of the earth. Hands up if you're born again. Right, if you're in any doubt, you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. <coughs> yeah. the, the, the phrase there, it was interesting that there was a difference. Yeah. We are the light of the world and the salt of the earth if we're born again Christians. The phrase there that in that, that previous passage, until the one who is holding him back is taken away. Who's holding him back? The church. Holy Spirit is holding him back. Where does Holy Spirit dwell? In us. If you're born again Christians, Holy Spirit dwells in you. The main presence of Holy Spirit in the world at the moment is in us, the church. Yeah. At the rapture, which Ian will go into, I'm not going to go into great detail here, there will be a rapture. We will be taken away and sin will have a completely free reign. So we are crucial. We are holding back sin from a completely free reign in the earth. Okay. <clears throat> But we must be spiritually alive, which leads to the complaint. Jesus says this, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. So Jesus' complaint is that you can be alive on the outside and dead on the inside. What's that called? Begins with our eight letters. What if you're dead on the out? So, sorry. <coughs> religion. Yeah, it's religion. Yeah. And, the world, and the world's full of it. We need to be spiritually alive. Yeah. So the church in Sardis were busy and very active, but they were spiritually dead. Activity does not equal vitality. Yeah. You can be a very busy church, but if the heart's not right, you are spiritually dead. As I've shown you, we must be spiritually alive to influence the culture and change it. The presence of works isn't enough. God requires a special intent and purpose. It must be done from a heart and a spirit that makes the works perfect before God. So what do we mean? There's a, there's a course called Goliath Must Fall and Ian and Phil who's not here today, they ran it a couple of times a few years ago. And as part of that course in Goliath Must Fall, the question was asked, when we do good deeds, is it so that or because? Do we do deeds so that we can get something from God or because of what God's done for us? And that's the difference. So whenever you do good deeds, I urge you to consider, is the heart right? Or is it religion? I'll give you a, a working example. I shared this a few years ago. There was a guy in America who wanted to give a waiter a $300 tip. He did it $100 at a time and he filmed the whole thing. So he's gone in the restaurant and he said to the waiter, I really want to bless you, here's $100. Filmed the waiter's reaction back to him, big smile, look at me. Then he gave him another $100. I want to really bless you, so here's another $100. Filmed the waiter's reaction back to him. He said, because I really, really want to bless you, here's another $100. Filmed the waiter's reaction. He then posted it on social media. Was his heart right? Who got the glory? He did. <coughs> Was it religion? Yes. Yeah. Was it so that or because? So that, yeah. 
What could he have done? He could have left the restaurant, give it to one of them. I said, don't tell him where it's from. Tell him Jesus loves him. Give him $300. I'm out of here. I've not filmed it. That would have made it perfect before God. Okay, the major lesson for this whole sermon is this. Calling yourself a Christian isn't enough. God doesn't accept nominal Christians. Being spiritually alive means more than just calling yourself a Christian. Are we watching? I'm guilty. I'm speaking to myself here as well. Are we watching TV, never reading the Bible, never producing fruit for God? I'm just as guilty as anybody else. This is, this is the equivalent situation of what's happening here at the church in Sardis. We don't want to be like that. We need to be spiritually alive. So, how do we keep our hearts pure? How do we develop into mature Christians doing perfect works for God? Scripture. Scripture is key. Scripture is God's main way of developing you to walk into your eternal destiny, developing your character so you walk into where God wants you to be. But the mark of spiritual maturity isn't how much you learn. It's what you put into practice. Jesus says this in Mark 13, 31. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The Bible never needs updating. It's perfect. But it's not God's way of giving you things for your consideration. It's his fixed, it's his fixed opinion. Yeah. But obedience is the key. Knowing and believing God's word doesn't fulfill your obligation. His instructions must be obeyed. What's the most quoted verse in the Bible? Yeah, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. <clears throat> Fantastic news. Amen. What does whoever believes in him mean? Does it mean you believe he existed? Or you know he died on the cross for you, so you have a need for forgiveness? If you know you need forgiveness and you repent, you will obey him. Go go ahead when you get time and read the the last verse in that chapter. John (coughs) 3.36. Whoever does not obey, (coughs) you look at the Greek translation for believe, it adds, does not obey. Whoever does not obey, the son will not see life, for the wrath of God remains on him. So God warns us, but be encouraged. <clears throat> anyone can change from this point onwards. I'm speaking to myself here as much as anyone. As soon as you repent and come to him with a pure heart, he will change you. As we saw earlier, God's looking for ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Yeah. He only needs a few. Yeah. Let's be part of the few. Amen. When we stand before Christ, we'll have two options, rewards or regrets. Be the fruit of the Spirit. Imagine people coming to you when they're struggling because your joy and peace of mind is so contagious. I've actually met people like that and they're they're a joy to be around. That's my aim, to get like that. You You can just see some people and you can see the love of Jesus in them. They're a pleasure to speak to no matter what's going on in their life. They are a beacon of hope and of light. Imagine people coming to you when they're struggling. When people face a crisis, they want real answers. But don't give them your opinion. It's one of thousands. Give them God's opinion. It's God's word that changes lives, not ours. Paul says this in Philippians 2, 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in accordance with his purposes. He also says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 22. To the weak I become weak to win the weak. 
I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. Let's be all things to all people. Let's be hospitable, humble of heart, generous with our lives, time and finances, and let our works be perfect before God. Go out there and have a go for Jesus. <coughs> put, put some money in an envelope and leave it. If you know a neighbour struggling, put a few quid in an envelope, post it for the letterbox so no one knows. Do the shopping for a neighbour. Yeah. Go out there and have a go. We can change the world if we're willing, committed and obedient. Jesus will use us. So let's have a go for Jesus and let him get the glory. Amen? Okay. <coughs> now, as I say in that preach... Um, I'm tweaking to myself as much as other people. I only speak about things that affect me as well. Yeah? So, if like me you've been struggling with having a perfect heart and doing perfect deeds, please come and ask for prayer. Yeah? We all need prayer. I'll be here, men ought to be here. A few of the guys will be here. If there's anything else that's bothering you, um, I know we're going to wrap up in a minute. We've got loads of time. There's more tea and coffee. Please come and ask for prayer. If you've got physical problems, any mental illnesses, financial, just, just come for prayer. Don't leave this building this morning without getting the prayer you need. Amen? Okay, thanks for listening. <laughs>